Today I'm delighted to be speaking at the Ananke Women in Literature Festival on April 1st, 2021, on behalf of Idara Tali Mohadahi and its flagship program, the Children's Literature Festival. I'm indeed a very privileged to be um, with Angela Joy today um, in this conversation uh, on today's children's literature beyond gender stereotyping. I thought what would be wonderful uh, for us would be to look at some of the publications uh, either directly produced or co-produced by ITA and the Children's Literature Festival along with other publishers or recently launched at the Children's Literature Festival events. The CLF, which began in 2011, has gone through 72 iterations and more recently, uh, both digital and hybrid ones. Um, and, and the work that it has been doing, which started with the provocation of low level of learning in children, which is mapped by another large scale countrywide program called the Annual Status of Education Report on basic assessments at grade two level of children five to 16 years of age. Though, though low level of learning could be um, for multiple reasons, but also the fact that we are so restricted in our school systems to textbooks and assessments that the pleasure of learning and the joy of discovering how we learn somehow gets completely minimized or eliminated. So today's topic is very close to my heart because as we know that um, gender stereotypes are very common in children's literature. Um, from books that started emerging, which we call classical children's literature, is extremely oppressive when it comes to how the boys and girls are portrayed in rigid gender constructs, which perpetuate inequalities. As I mentioned, the Taiti has been self-publishing and collaborating with other authors and publishers for these new works of literacy, language, and identity um, so that we can develop characters who exist beyond or really in defiance of stereotypes. We feel it is an obligation, not just for parents and teachers, but also children themselves to understand the kind of harm and the kind of pervasiveness that exists in our literature and books with respect to gender stereotypes. The books that CLF has been engaged in are biographies, memoirs, fiction, travelogues, and they all in some ways or the other are countering these stereotypes and also moving towards new constructions of, um, of human lives and their journeys of self-discovery. We have been involved in the Children's Literature Festival with storytelling. Because storytelling today is one of the most powerful ways of being able to sell an idea, to drive an idea home, and also mobilized a lot of action on creative writing to foster identity or multiple identities which counter the socially confining definitions of what and how a girl or a boy should be. So, as I said, I'd be speaking about the recent publications and the book launches. And the first one that comes to my mind is the ABCs of Pakistan. And I want to share that because, of course, it's a recently published, co-published by CLF and Why Books in 2020, written by Marzie Abbas and illustrated by Michelle Khan. Um, it's exciting because I think for me, it resonates with my first protest. I remember being age four and really protesting so much against the radiant reader that I had to read or was inflicted upon because I felt why I cannot even relate to Rover being my dog or Mary being my mother, and why should we be subjected to doing our basic 
reading and literacy through such ideas and subsequently as we've seen the way ABCs are taught it's always the proverbial A for apple, B for boy or B for bat, C for cat and so on and you know the point is that this is also not an authentic construct in, of schools in Pakistan or writers but really is a colonial derivative and we are stuck with those colonial nar narratives even 73 years after independence. So this ABCs of Pakistan is such a refreshing book because it focuses on the travels of boy who's called Hassan and his pet cat called Makkhan and Makkhan in Urdu means or English means butter and um, and the travels go from Karachi, sunny beaches, all the way to the Karakoram peaks. And so how are ABCs used in this to be able to create um, powerful, relatable learning for children, but at the same time, emulating role models such as Malala, Yusuf Zai, Noor Jahan, Eidi Saab, and many more. But also it is going, as I said, beyond the ossified colonial contexts. And the representations in the books are really to die for because they're talking about crafts, accomplishments of girls and boys, women and men, heritage, humanism, uh, celebrating um, religious uh, festivals, the capabilities and the diversity which Pakistan is and every country is so richly endowed with. But we never get to see those. And so it's just fantastic when you see that C is for Cholistan or H is for Hingol, which is um, a very large national, the largest national park in Pakistan and Balochistan. It just makes us feel so much delighted to own and to relate to something which belongs to us. And you, know, you can do it to so many variations. I move on to another recent launch. Um, the book is called Comb, A Girlhood in the Shadow of the Legendary Khyber Pass. This is by Shadab Zeez Hashmi. She's a Pakistani-American poet and essayist, and she's written several books, including Coal and Chalk, Baker of Tarifa, and Ghazal Cosmopolitan, and now Comb. This is published by Sable Books in 2020. And incidentally, it was the first launch of uh, the Comb at the Pakistan Learning Festival in February 2021. So it's about a girl, and this is Shadab's work, which when she's growing up in, under the spell of history um, in the shadow of the legendary Khyber Pass. Uh, and this is the same time when she was growing 16 years of her life in Peshawar, the area where at that time, uh, the Afghan war is also taking place just alongside that border next door and the book is really and her memoirs are both a bridge between disparate civilizations and an impassable divide so comb as we know kangi it is an item of adornment and femininity which is used as a form of power and an instrument of peace Comb is a recurrent metaphor transforming through the interplay between gender and freedoms. And so the book is really targeted towards adolescence. And I do want to suggest that whilst on the one hand we are talking about alternate narratives and setting aside gender stereotypes for children when they are very young because that's very important. But I think adolescence is a very important uh, period of our formation when again we revisit our constructs and rebel often against them and try to create our new ones. So Comb is, uh, I wanted to read some pieces from her books and uh, I mean I just love every piece and what is nice about the book is every chapter is like two pages, three pages, very quick. Each one is wholesome and comprehensive on its own and here she's writing about her experience with the uh, acrobats and in Peshawar. And, I'm, and she said, writes, I'm especially impressed by the agility and strength of the female acrobats 
and I find that my eyes are not trained to follow motion so fast or to pass the visual language of arms, torsos, legs, forming pedestals for others to stand on or to hang from. I will grow up to learn that womanhood is exactly this, a feat of acrobats, uh, sorry, a feat of acrobatics with proverbial lifting, boosting, connecting, carrying, but mostly bending in innumerable ways, not spectacular or even visible, an apparatus with a secretly turbulent energy fueling the constant mechanics of multifarious demands. We are taught to bear with silence, taught that silence is grace, and grace is a dialect of might. I let you make what you want of it. And Sen Shadab is a poet and, and author. I just love the pieces that she's written on the comb. And this one is the comb engraved with a battle scene. The comb engraved with a battle scene has 19 fine teeth and five fully formed lions squeezed between two bars of solid gold. Empire, having struck the lions feeble as rotten goads, uses their hunched ferocity as a vignette to frame a scene ripe for violence, a cavalier about to drive a spear into the enemy whose shield is more like a harp, filled with song, fractures for future gnawing, whose fallen horse with upturned legs is a baby I want to cradle. Four bent legs of pure gold will flail atop a wealthy woman's head as she smooths her curls in the looking glass. Now, I mean, amazing. Look at that ferocity on the one hand and the softness a baby I want to cradle. Wow. And only a woman could have written this. I mean, it's just superb. And imagine the imagery and the feelings, um, the powerful feminist feelings that come right through that. And then this one, which I especially love, called Wedding Combs. Out of the hundred clove-scented, fine-spun braids in the bride's hair, how many will the groom unravel? A wedding night on this mountain rings with the clangor of the women folk, gilt-edged, tassel-tied, prismatic. Look, the tatters in the velvet of lunar night, her new entwined life knots to open every night until our hair becomes white. A vow on a different mountain is exchanged with a gift of gomes, carved of mahogany and completed in 72 steps. And while God swears by epochs, we are fathomed by the gaze of a single autumn, half the susurrus between the wings of a Himalayan bulbul, less with each gombing. And this is again so beautiful, it precedes Shadab's own experience of a marriage, which is so beautifully put, uh, following page 87. And I mentioned this to Shadab when we launched the book as well, that, you know, even in our literature, ancient and classical late literature, uh, uh, there is this whole notion of the comb and how comb is so important in the true. So as Amir Khosrow writes, which is sung so beautifully in Hare Hare Bhag, ba and I, I sang those two verse, one verse for her, and I feel one should sing here as well, um, because it's this is so beautiful. And it says it goes like this: Hare Hare Bal Mandamore Babul Hare Hare Bal. Manda more babul pano chaba manda re hare hare bhag ek nadini sar more gangi mori saas bol bolat hai so na dinu rupa vidinu so na dinu rupa vidinu babul dil tari 
Yaure, hare, hare, and what it says is that you know father in my truth so you gave me everything you go gave me gold you gave me silver but that one comb that you forgot to give me my mother-in-law is now telling me off that you know what happened your father could not even afford a comb and you did not come to you start your new life with a comb that must should have come from your home and imagine the crumbling heart of the new bride the way comb is a real metaphor and thank you shadab i think it should be an essential read for anyone who's looking at aspects of um, rewriting the narratives on gender stereotypes and how you take the metaphor and the object of the comb and turn it around for empowerment of women and we come to Bahadur Rima, which has been written, uh, actually it's a room to read book, which has been recently translated by Idara Tari and CLF in 2020. And the translation is by Arfa Bakas. The author is Raqibul Islam and illustrator is Shamim Ahmed. And the book really is about a girl called Rima who went to, who went to a lovely festival accompanied by her uncle or rather the uncle takes her and she gets lost there and as she gets lost rather than panicking suddenly she comes across another child who's lost who's even younger than her and then she goes about and says instead of panicking i'm going to not just reunite with my uncle but i'm going to try and see how i can help the small child reunite with his parents and so she does that but the entire book is so colorful uh, it talks about different religions, the variety of colors, and the messages of social inclusion which are sent to children, and the courage of a young girl called, who's called, who's called Courageous Rima. Mohinder Daro is my third publication, and again, it is a joint publication by Oxford University Press and the Children's Literature Festival in 2015. It was commissioned uh, um, and written and illustrated by Fozia Aziz Minella. And Fozia uh, takes, uh, has this amazing character she has created called Amai, and she is a magical bird of light. Amai in Pashto means mother. So she's termed the whole, cons the mother visualized as the bird of peace because she, she, Amai is white and this is a bird of light who has this tremendous transformative powers and she takes these two children again the girl and the boy uh, who are now part of uh, you know experiencing civilizations together and finding out how in those old days of Mahindudaro uh, they go and discover the dancing girl they go to the king priest room they find that bronze statue of the dancing girl and um, and you know it was Ali who says um, uh, that you know uh, what strange people they are and Amai scolds them and tells them off that never use the word strange if they're people different you don't call them you'll try to discover what is different about them and respect them and so Amai becomes the interlocutor and she's beginning to look at and and also through conversation um, suggesting that children need to look at differences in a very dignified and self-respecting manner rather than looking down on differences and similarly as they move on in Mohinder Daro and they go uh, to the priest and the and Ali says we are from Pakistan we live in the 21st century our friend Amai has brought us back to time to see if there were many uni any unicorns in Mohenjo Daros. But he says that we now are finding more about your people. And we find everything so, and he again says different. And the king priest says, well, you might find us strange, but if you were born in Mohenjo Daro, you would have known that we are the most civilized people in the world. And Seema says to the king priest, we would like to know more about your civilization. 
And he, the king priest, says, while many people still live in jungles and small settlements, we have developed a proper city. We love clean items and lanes and regularly take a bath. That is why we have this great bath. He continued, here I will give you some clay toys that our children play with. And it's so beautiful, the whole book, you know, as they hear the songs of those times and discover that actually in ancient times there was perhaps more civilization as much to learn from the past but it's two together both Ali and Seema together discovering and rewriting the narratives for their own lives the unusual pedagogy of learning which was um, a book that was edited by Rabia Jalil and Shahana Rajani both unusual artists who thought let's give more agency to children of Karachi. Karachi is a mega city of more than 24 million people and they decided to write this book or edit this book called Mapping Migrations and it was translated because it's bilingual by Amra Alam again a very well-known children's author and this was in 2015 too and they decide that they will look at children in, of Karachi because Karachi is of, made of none, I think 99% migrant communities. And there, how do we negotiate cultural identity, mobility, the changing interconnection hierarchies of a globalizing city, and how children's perception of place reveal not only how to build and negotiate family relationships across multiple spaces, but also their deeply physical experiences are highlighted that strike a sense of immediacy and declarations of joy. So it is through the eyes of the children this initiative uh, looks at um, their discoveries about migration and the city. And it is done through the pedagogy of conversations, art and drawings, map making, photography and oral history. I've spoken a lot about this, as have Rabia and Shahana and others and my colleague Serish. But what is beautiful is how the children really um, unsilence in a very sensitive ma manner to make the invisible that we don't never notice become visible in migrant colonies. And you know, children have been always at the center of these migrations, but they're never asked. And you know, how they look at things like luggage, um, and I love this little image where Shilpa draws her mother's suitcase from her imagination. So beautifully done. Only maybe a girl could have done that. Her mother's dubatta are only there. And her bag where you can see all those different items which she transparently shows. And her, a suitcase which is always ready to roll. A dubatta that has to be quickly wrapped around. And if they are displaced, they have to move on to another colony. And the illustrations in the books were created all by the children, like you seeing them holding one. And there were three such beautiful cre creations. And the book is gorgeous. The, its size, the way it has these um, beautiful um, artwork by the children of different sizes that can be rolled out of the book. But, you know, the children were reimagining their past, their homelands, the family professions and lives, which help uncover the perspective of both genders on the issue of migration. And um, as again, as I said, the child agency is foremost in these four colonies, which is inhabited by the Myanmar refugees, the Rohingyas, Bangladeshis, Sindhis, Pashtuns, Punjabis, many living below the, um, what shall I say, uh, in a subterranean way, who have to give up sometimes their languages to especially the Rohingyas and the Bangladeshis so they can get their CNICs, the ID cards, because they're often there as illegal migrants. Uh, absolutely, we should do more of those books by children themselves. Um, the, the next book is again a very endearing book which was commissioned and Rumana Hussain, who's our advisor and a great author of children's literature, uh, she wrote and illustrated by, this is illustrated by Akbar Zia and published by OUP and CLF in 2015. Again, the unusual story. So you're using animals and birds symbolically 
of the unusual, unequal so-called relationship between Tota Khan, who's sort of a masculine character, the parrot, and Bakriyara, the feminine character, the goat. And they go on a journey across Pakistan. And this is, again, a comment not only about re doing new narratives for gender, but also new narratives in a society where our children have forgotten both history and geography, where it's not the children, it's just the way our curriculum is manufactured, where it is a political decision to set aside geography and history and create social studies or Pakistan studies. But what happens is it comes at a terrible cost. We forget the rich diversity, so Romana takes us through the Kalashes and the festivals up near in Chitral in the north, then traveling down the river Indus, the mighty river Indus, going all the way in the images you see of Sakhar and Khairpur, the mass, beautiful, almost I call it the wonder of the world, the date picking of uh, Khairpur in Sindh. But so many places they go to, through the Sibbi Mela and um, go to Chakwal, um, through, go through these beautiful um, festivals of Pakistan and they make you feel so delighted about the heritage, um, the cultural practices, the diversity of characters, the gender equality which seems to be the norm, you know, when you see so many women involved in economic activities as well as festive activities and they are seen as strong participants and upholders of heritage again putting aside those gender fixed gender stereotypes which exist somewhere in books and narratives but not really in real lives and sometimes of course in real lives as well and of course in laws too and that brings me to across the line by nanika Matani. Uh, amazing book it's on partition but again through the eyes of these two children and their grand parents published by penguin india and random house india and in 2019 and you know the book is just fabulous again it's looking it's situated in delhi pindi and even london and moves from 47 1947 to 2012 but you know, the book is about a poignant message about how drawing a simple line divided families, divided fates, and altered the course of people's lives. Both characters, the young Jay and Anaya, adolescents, who despite their differences, you know, have a beautiful bond. And Anaya is into cricket, while Jay is into becoming a chef in food. But the book is to die for, and it's a real rich and a wonderful read. This was launched at the Pakistan Learning Festival in February 2021 recently. But um, this was, uh, so it was a conversation with Nanika and with Nadia Jamil and myself. Uh, but what happened was real chemistry there as Nadia did readings, beautiful readings of the conversations that go on in the book. And um, and she said, there were two things that came out. She said, why can't this be an audiobook? And can you imagine, as a result of the launch, Penguin agreed to have an audiobook, and we will soon have this as an audiobook. But more than that also, um, Nadia said, we, it is, there's a phrase there, piecing it together. And I said, why can't we have a Facebook group called Piecing It Together? And there we have a Facebook group now. I think it's almost 900 people now. And it's just one of the most healing groups. Please go there and watch it. But it's just what comes out of what you think is really a consumer item as a festival. But it is anything but a consumer item. It's a producer's space where we are rewriting texts and narratives and, and classical, horrible ways of looking at gender constructs. Um, but... Nerika has produced a whole PowerPoint with it, but she shows how powerfully that if you take images of food, of, of uh, heritage, how it seems that that line, that across the line, just fades away. And look at those images right here. 
So you have Fatehpur Sikri courtyard in Agra on one side and the Wazir Khan courtyard in Lahore on the other side. And you know, they are, they are just exquisite ways of being able to uh, relish uh, what seems to be so common. And whether it is, we are all foodies, whether it is pakoras on the one side and jalebis on the other side, we can relate to the hunger pangs the color, and you can almost see the textures of both these amazing food items, street food items, completely equalized in terms of its feelings, but also, you know, the taste uh, that no one can take away. No line can divide this. And that's the big message of this work. And then we've got these recent books that was written recently by myself and Serish Farooq, again, illustrator is Akbar Zia, it is on COVID, but again, who is really, so we've got two, um, sister and brother, um, but they, it's the mother, the young, the mother who tells them all about COVID, the protection, the care, and the values, and not just the life skills on how to protect themselves, but how to value neighborhoods nearby and to look after people there. And, um, so again, the equal rights of education for both girls and boys and mother as a catalyst for contemporary learning and caring actions. And finally, Lena's Pouncy Puppy. Uh, this was done by Anam Khan. It's self-published in 2019. And it's about a young girl called Lena, seven years old, and her puppy, Leo. And uh, Lena is a hardworking girl who loves to read and play with her puppy. And Lena is a show, is basically seen as a role model for girls her age. And she wants, has many ambitions. And she wants to, um, unlike the usual ways of what will girls do, she really wants to be ambitious and wants to have careers such as becoming a lawyer someday and wants to become an empowered member of society. Uh, the thought about this work, the way we want to, and these book publications are available online on us, uh, some with us in Indara Tali Mwagai at the CLF bookstore. Others um, are available in, on Amazon and uh, OUP. Um, so I would really urge you, but this is our, I thought the best way we could explain and share with everyone this notion of looking at gender stereotypes through our publications and book launches you know, as part of the Children's Learning Festival and the Pakistan Learning Festival, I think was, is, is very deliberate. And um, I, I just think that whether it's Angela Joy, who's written um, amazing uh, work, how, you know, people from the North and South can come together because we'll be surprised that um, Issues of gender stereotyping are not a story only of the South. They are as much embedded in the challenges that we see again and again of uh, the North as well. Um, the whole challenge of color, caste and creed is not just restricted to the South. So let's join hands and see what will rewrite these narratives will really cast away this gender stereotyping, but more importantly, bring us together for, as Nadia and Nenika say, piecing it together. Thank you very much. And I want to thank my team who helped put this together. Um, Rania Saeed, uh, Najaf Ali, Kamar, Afta, and Farasha. Um, I believe we can take this um, method, methodology, share it far and wide and keep on replacing it with new books. I also wanted to thank profusely the wonderful arrangements made for the festival by Sabine Muzaffar and her team. It has been an honor to be on this panel um, with Angela Joy, uh, moderated by Sabine Muzaffar. Thank you so much.